Early on the morning of 9th February, a telephone call is heard at headquarters. From Frankfurt, it is reported that last night the Russians made a crossing over the Oder at the village of Lebus, north of the city, and with the support of tanks are holding a bridgehead on the west bank of the river. The situation is more than critical, there are no infantry nearby to attack them, and there is no way to get heavy artillery there that could stop the enemy. So there is nothing to keep the Soviet tanks from starting a march on the capital, or at least cutting the Frankfurt-Berlin railway and motorway, which are vital to supplying the front on the Oder. We are flying there to find out how fair this report is. From afar I can already see the pontoon bridge, and long before we approach it, anti-aircraft guns open fire on us. The Russians have prepared something of an appetizer for us. One of my squadrons is attacking a bridge laid right across the ice. We don't have much hope of achieving anything substantial. As we know from experience, the Ivans have so much construction material that they can rebuild the bridge almost instantly. I fly low overhead with the anti-tank planes and look for tanks on the west bank of the river. I can make out their tracks, but I can't see the steel monsters themselves. Or were those the tracks of artillery tractors? I go even lower to be absolutely sure, and see the tanks well camouflaged in the folds of the river valley, on the northern edge of the village of Lebus. There are probably twelve or fifteen of them here. Something hits the wing, a hit from a light anti-aircraft gun. I keep low anti-aircraft guns are firing from everywhere. The river crossing is defended by about six or eight anti-aircraft batteries. The anti-aircraft gunners seem to have been playing these games for a long time and have gained a lot of experience in fighting Stukas. They do not use tracers, we do not see the threads of red beads strung towards us. We realize that they have opened fire only when the plane suddenly shudders from the impact. As soon as we gain altitude, they immediately stop firing and our bombers can't see who they are attacking. Only if you fly very low over the target, you can see flames bursting out of the gun barrel like torch fire. I'm wondering what to do. There is no way to approach the target stealthily, as the flat river valley does not allow for such tactics. There are no tall buildings or trees. Sober reflection leads me to conclude that experience and tactical skills can help, even if all the basic rules that follow from them are broken. The answer a determined attack and hope for luck. If I had always been this adventurous, I could have gone to my grave dozens of times already. But there are no our troops nearby and we are 80 kilometres from the capital of the Reich, a dangerously short distance if enemy tanks are rushing towards it. There is no more time for prolonged reflection. You'll have to rely on luck this time, I say to myself. Go. I order the other pilots to maintain altitude. There are several newcomers among them, and so far they can't be expected to do much damage to the enemy in this defence. On the contrary, we are likely to suffer unnecessarily high casualties ourselves. When I get lower down, and as soon as flashes of anti-aircraft guns become visible, they will have to concentrate the fire of their guns on the anti-aircraft guns. There is always a chance that this will confuse the Ivans and affect their accuracy. There are a few as tanks standing here, the rest are T-34s. After four tanks catch fire and I run out of ammunition, we fly back. I talk about my observations and emphasize the fact that I attacked only taking into account the proximity of Berlin, otherwise such an attack would have been unjustified. If we had held the front further east, I would have waited for a more favorable situation, or at least for the moment when the tanks would come out of the zone of protection of their anti-aircraft installations concentrated around the bridge. After two sorties I change aircraft because mine has sustained damage from anti-aircraft fire. The fourth time I fly back and they're already burning all twelve tanks. 
I am flying on a glide over in his tank, which is spewing smoke, but still does not catch fire. Every time before going into the attack, I rise to 800 meters, because it is difficult for anti-aircraft guns to hit me at this height. From there I dive steeply, desperately tossing the machine from side to side. When I'm nowhere near the tank, I level the car at the moment of the shot, and then drift sideways over the tank itself, following the same evasive tactics, to the point where I can gain altitude again out of range of the anti-aircraft guns. I would of course need to approach the target more slowly when my aeroplane has better control, but that would be suicidal. Only through extensive experience and somnambulistic self-confidence am I able to level the machine for a split second and hit the tank at its most vulnerable points. Of course, such attacks could never be carried out by my colleagues for the simple reason that they lack sufficient experience. The blood pulses furiously in my head. I know I'm playing cat and mouse with fate, but this is must be set on fire. Once again to 800 meters altitude and down to the 60-ton Leviathan. It still won't light. I'm choking with rage. It has to light up and it will. The red light on the panel board is flashing. And then there's this. One of the guns has a jammed breech, the other has only one shell left in it. I'm climbing up again. Isn't it crazy to risk everything for one shot? For once my Ju-87 takes much longer than usual to gain altitude at 800 metres, as I now begin to weigh the pros and cons. One of my eyes says, if that 13th tank still hasn't caught fire, don't imagine you can get your way with one shell. Fly home and replenish your ammunition, you can always find it later. To this my other self replies with fervour perhaps there is only one shell missing to prevent this tank from rolling freely across Germany. Roll on Germany? That sounds like melodrama. A lot more Russian tanks will roll across Germany if you fail badly at your job, and you're about to fail, don't be under any illusions. Only a madman would stoop so low for one shot. It's pure madness. Now you're going to say you couldn't do anything just because it was the 13th tank. What nonsense all that superstition. You only have one shell left, so drop this indecision and get to work. And here I am already going down from a height of 800 metres. Concentrate on the flight, throw the plane from side to side, here again the guns are spitting fire at me. Now I'm levelling the machine. Fire. The tank bursts into flames. With glee in my heart, I fly over the burning tank. I spiral upwards. The engine crackles and suddenly a red hot steel blade pierces my leg. My eyes go black, my breath catches. But I must keep flying. Flying. I mustn't lose consciousness. Clench your teeth. You must overcome your weakness. Spasms of pain roll through my entire body. Ernest, my leg's been blown off. No, if it was torn off, you wouldn't be able to talk. Our left wing is on fire. You need to land, we've been hit by two 40mm anti-aircraft shells. A frightening darkness envelops my eyes, I can't see anything else. Tell me where to land. Then get me out faster so I don't get burned alive. I can't see anything else piloting obeying one instinct. I vaguely recall starting each attack from south to north and then turning left. Thus I must be flying west towards home. This goes on like this for several minutes. I don't understand why the wing still hasn't fallen off yet. I'm actually flying northwest almost parallel to the Russian front. On your own shouts Gaderman over the intercom, and I feel myself slowly sinking into a sort of fog, a, a pleasant oblivion. Handle on yourself shouts Gaderman again, what was that? Trees or telephone wires? 
I feel nothing and pull the handle towards me only because that's what Gaiderman is shouting. If only this burning pain in my leg would stop. And this flight. If only I could let myself sink into this strange grey world and into the distance that beckons me. Pull once again I automatically push down on the handle, but now for a moment Gaiderman really wakes me up. I suddenly realise I have to do something. What's down there? It's bad a rot. But I have to go down, or else this dangerous apathy will come over me again and I'll lose control of my body. I push down on the left pedal and scream in agony. But I've been hit in the right leg, haven't I? I lift the nose of the plane up. Just so we don't sparachute. The plane is on fire. There's a thud and the plane glides for a few more moments. Now I can rest, slip into the grey distance. Wonderful. Crazy pain jerks me back to consciousness. Is someone dragging me? The ground here is so uneven. It's all over. At last I'm in the arms of silence. I come to everything around me is white. Attentive faces, a pungent odour. I'm lying on an operating table. Suddenly panic grips me, where is my leg? It's gone. The surgeon nods. Down the mountain on brand new skis. Diving. Athletics. Pole vaulting. What does it all mean to me now? How many friends have been hurt more seriously? Remember, one in the hospital, in Dnepropetrovsk's face and both arms were torn off by a mine explosion. The loss of a leg, of an arm, of a head, none of that matters, if only the victim could have saved the motherland from mortal danger. It's not a catastrophe. The only catastrophe is that I won't be able to fly for weeks. And this in such a critical situation. These thoughts rush through my brain for a second, and the surgeon says to me softly. There was nothing I could do. Apart from a few scraps of flesh and fibres, there was nothing there, so the leg had to be amputated. If there was nothing else there, I think to myself with grim humour, what was he able to amputate? Well, surely it's normal for him, routine. But why is the other leg in plaster, he asks in amazement, since last November? Where am I? In the main field hospital of the SS troops in Zilowal. Oh, in Zilowi. That's seven kilometres from the front line. So I was obviously flying northwest, not west. You were brought here by the SS and one of our medical officers performed the operation? You have another wounded man on your conscience, he adds with a smile. Did I bite the surgeon? Well, you didn't get to that, he says, shaking his head. No, you didn't bite him. But Lieutenant Coral tried to land on the storch near where you made your emergency landing. But it must have been too difficult, his aeroplane sparachuted. And now his head is bandaged. Good old Coral. It seems that even though I was flying unconscious, I had a few guardian angels. Meanwhile, the Reichsmarshal has sent his personal doctor with instructions to take me immediately to the hospital, which is housed in a bomb-proof bunker on the grounds of Zoo, Berlin's Zoo. But the surgeon who operated on me doesn't want to hear about it because I've lost too much blood. Tomorrow everything will be all right. The Reichsmarshal's doctor tells me that Goering immediately reported the incident to the Führer. Hitler, he says, was very pleased that I got off relatively lightly. Of course, if the chickens want to be smarter than the hen, he said, as I was relayed, among other things. I was relieved that he didn't mention that he had forbidden me to fly. I suppose that in view of the desperate fighting and general situation of the last few weeks, my participation in the fighting was taken for granted. The next day I am transferred to the Tisu bunker, 
which also serves as a platform for the heaviest anti-aircraft guns involved in the defense of the capital against raids against the civilian population. On the second day, a telephone appears on the nightstand by my bed. I have to communicate with my unit about combat operations, general situation etesheration. I know I won't be in bed for long and I don't want to lose my post, so I'm concerned about staying informed and involved in unit affairs, even if only by phone. The doctors and nurses who have shown me touching care are, at least in this respect, not very happy with their new patient. They keep saying something about rest. Almost every day I am visited by colleagues from the unit or other friends, some of them just people who introduce themselves as my friends to make their way to my room. When they are pretty girls, they open their eyes wide and raise their eyebrows questioningly when they see my wife sitting by the bedside. They have already started talking to me about a prosthesis, although they don't know the extent of my recovery yet. I am impatient and want to get up as soon as possible. A little while later, I am visited by a denture maker. I ask him to make me a temporary prosthesis with which I can fly, even though the stump has not yet healed. Several first-class companies refuse on the grounds that it is too early. One craftsman accepts the order, but only as an experiment. He goes at it so vigorously that I get dizzy. He applies the plaster all the way up to the groin without lubricating the surface or adjusting the protective cap. After letting the plaster dry, he advises succinctly, think of something nice. At the same moment, he pulls with all his might on the plaster, to which my hair is stuck and rips it out by the root. The pain makes me feel like the end of the world. This bloke has clearly made the wrong choice of profession. He should have been shoeing horses. Meanwhile, my third squadron and regimental headquarters have moved to Gorlitz the same town where I went to school. My parents' home is quite close by. Right now the Russians are pushing their way into the village, Soviet tanks rolling over the places where my childhood passed. I could go crazy just thinking about it. My family, like millions of others, have long since become refugees, unable to save anything but their lives. I lie there, doomed to inaction. What have I done to deserve this? I don't have to think about it. Flowers and all sorts of gifts that are brought to my room every day are proof of the love of the people for their soldiers. In addition to the Reichsmarschall, I am visited twice by the Minister of Propaganda Goebbels, with whom I was not previously acquainted. He is interested in my opinion on the strategic situation in the East. The front on the order I tell him is our last chance to hold off the Soviets, and with it the capital will fall. But he compares Berlin to Leningrad. He points out that this city has not fallen because all its inhabitants have turned every house into a fortress. And what the people of Leningrad were able to do, the people of Berlin will be able to do as well. His idea is to achieve the highest degree of organization in the defense of every home by installing radio transmitters in every building. He is convinced that his Berliners would prefer death to the prospect of falling victim to the Red Hordes. Just how serious he was would later prove his own end. From the military point of view, I see it differently, I replied. Once the battle for Berlin begins after the fall of the front on the Oder, I believe it will be absolutely impossible to hold the city. I would like to remind you that it is impossible to compare the two cities. Leningrad had the advantage of being protected on the west by the Gulf of Finland and on the east by Lake Ladoga. To the north of it there was only one week. Finnish Front the only chance of capturing it was an attack from the south, but from this side Leningrad was strongly fortified and its defenders were able to take advantage of an excellent system of pre-prepared positions. In addition, the city was never completely cut off from the supply line. Cargo boats could cross Lake Ladoga in summer 
and in winter the Russians had laid a railway line across the ice and were able to supply the city from the north. My arguments can't change his mind. After a fortnight I can already get up for a short time and enjoy the fresh air. During air raids I am on the roof of the concrete Tisu Tower, where the anti-aircraft guns are mounted, and I can see from below what is probably so unpleasant to those in the air. I am not bored, Fridolin brings me papers that require my signature, sometimes he is accompanied by my colleagues. Field Marshal Graham, Skorzeny or Hanna Reich drop in to chat with me for an hour. Some event is always going on. I am only tormented by the fact that I am apart from them. When I got to the zoo bunker, I vowed that I would be back on my feet in six weeks at the latest and flying. The doctors know that their injunctions are useless and can only make me angry. At the beginning of March I go out for a walk in the fresh air for the first time on crutches. During my convalescence I am invited to my home by one of the nurses, and here I am, the guest of the Minister of Foreign Affairs. A real soldier rarely makes a good diplomat, and this meeting with von Ribbentrop is quite intriguing. It is an opportunity for conversations that shed light on the other side of a war that is being fought without the use of arms. He wants to know my opinion of the forces opposing each other on the Eastern Front and of our military potential at the moment. I tell him that we on the Front hope he is doing something through diplomatic channels to loosen the dead grip with which both sides are clutching. Is it not possible to demonstrate to the Western powers that Bolshevism is their greatest enemy and that after the final victory over Germany it will be as much a threat to them as it is to us and that they alone cannot get rid of it? He takes my remarks as a mild personal reproach. No doubt I am only repeating what he has already heard many times from others. He immediately explains to me that he has already made a number of attempts which have ended in failure, because each time a new retreat on one or the other section of the front, soon after he had begun negotiations, encouraged the enemy to continue the war and leave the negotiating table. He mentions these instances and says reproachfully that the treaties he concluded before the war, among others with England and Russia, were no small achievement if not a triumph but no one remembers them any more today, people see only the negative aspects for which he is not responsible. Naturally, even now the negotiations are still going on, but with the situation as it is, the chances of the success he still hopes for look problematic. This glimpse behind the diplomatic scene satisfies my curiosity, and I am not burning to know anything more. In mid-March, in the spring sunshine, I take my first walk around the zoo, accompanied by my nurse, and during my first excursion a small accident happens to me. We, like many others, are fascinated by the caged monkeys. I am taken by a particularly large monkey sitting lazily with a completely indifferent look on a bitch from which its long tail hangs. Of course I can't help but do something I shouldn't, and stick my crutch through the bars with the intention of tickling its tail. No sooner do I touch the tail than the monkey suddenly grabs hold of my crutches and tries with all his might to drag me into the cage. I hop up on one foot to the bars themselves, but of course the beast can't drag me through them. Edelgard's sister grabs hold of me and together we pull the crutches towards me. Man versus ape. Her paws begin to slide over the smooth surface of the crutch and reach the rubber cap at the very end that keeps the crutches from digging deeply into the ground or slipping when walking. The rubber cap piques her curiosity. The monkey sniffs it, pulls it off the crutch, and swallows it with a wide grin. At the same moment I am able to pull the crutch out of the cage and at least partially win this fight. A few seconds later there is the howl of sirens warning of an air raid. The fast walking on the sandy paths of Tsu makes me sweat, because without rubber caps my crutches sink deeply into the sand. Everyone around me is hurrying and bustling. I can hardly use their help and continue to waddle, limping badly.
It's slow work. We barely make it to the bunker before the first bombs start falling. Easter is coming. I want to get back to the unit before it comes. My regiment is now based around Grossenheim in Saxony. The first squadron has flown again from Hungary to the Vienna area and is still on the southeastern front. Gaderman is at Brunswick the whole time I am away, so that he can attend to the treatment of the sick in the meantime. I call him to tell him that I have ordered a U-87 to pick me up at Tempelhof at the end of the week and intend to return to the unit. Since Gaderman had spoken to my attending physician shortly before, he cannot fully believe this. Besides, he's ill himself. I will not meet him again during the war, on those last operations which are about to begin. My gunner's place is taken by Lieutenant Neerman, who has no lack of combat experience, and who wears the Knight's Cross. Obeying orders to report to the Fuhrer before leaving, I bid him farewell in the bunker. He speaks again and again of being pleased with my relatively smooth recovery. He doesn't forbid me to fly, probably because the thought of me flying more combat missions just doesn't cross his mind. So here I am, sitting in my plane again, flying to my battle buddies for the first time in six weeks. It's Easter Eve, and I'm happy. Shortly before takeoff, Fridolin calls and asks me to fly directly to the Sudetes. He is going to move the unit to Kummer AMC near Nimes. At first I feel very strange in the aeroplane, but soon I am back in my element. The controls are difficult because I can only use one pedal. I can't push the right pedal because my prosthesis isn't ready yet, so I use my left foot to lift up the left pedal. This movement lowers the right pedal and I get the desired result. My stump is in a cast and stretched out under the dashboard with no risk of hitting anything. An hour and a half later I land at the new airfield at Kummer. The regiment arrived here an hour ahead of me. Our aerodrome is situated in a splendid place between two spurs of the Sudeten Mountains and is surrounded on all sides by forests. Nearby is the picturesquey cast Lake Kummer. Until the cantonment problem is solved, we sleep in a hotel room. Here in the Sudis there is still an atmosphere of complete peace and tranquility. The enemy is behind the mountains and this front is held by troops under Field Marshal Shauna, so this unperturbed calm is not so absurd. Nearer eleven o'clock we hear the high voices of a children's choir singing Got Grussy Deeksh. The local school, led by the hostess, greets us with a serenade. This singing is something new to us veterans. It touches strings that now, at this stage of the war, we will soon have to forget. We listen spellbound, each of us immersed in our own thoughts. We feel that these children believe in our ability to repel the impending danger, with all its attendant horrors. At the end of their song, I thank them for the charming encounter and invite them to visit our aerodrome in the morning to see our birds. They turn up the next day and I begin the procedure by taking off in my anti-tank plane and firing at a one-third square metre target. The children stand in a semi-circle and can imagine attacking an enemy tank. It's a good warm-up for me to try to hit with one foot. On the opposite slope of the Sudeten Mountains is still closed by fog, and since we can't make a combat sortie, I have some free time so I take a Fock Wolf 190D9 into the air and demonstrate aerial acrobatics at high and low altitude. This genius, Hopman Kachner, my engineering officer, has already redesigned the foot brakes, which are indispensable for this fast aircraft in such a way that they can be operated by hand. The moment I go to land, everyone gesticulates furiously and points to the sky. I look back and through gaps in the tattered clouds I see American Mustangs and Thunderbolts circling overhead. They are flying at an altitude of one and a half to two kilometers above a layer of fog. They didn't see me, or I wouldn't have been able to land safely. The Thunderbolts are carrying bombs and appear to be busy searching for a target, 
most likely our aerodrome. Quickly, to the extent that word applies to a one-legged man in a cast, I jump to where the others are standing. They all need to take shelter somewhere urgently. I push the kids into the cellar, where at least they won't get hit by debris. Since the house we're using as headquarters is the only one on the airfield, it's sure to be a target for those guys circling up there. I go in last to reassure the kids, and that's when the first bombs fall, one close to the building, the explosion rips out the window frames and blows the roof off. Our air defence is too weak to repel this raid, but it proves to be enough to prevent attacks from low altitude. Fortunately, none of the children were hurt. I am very saddened that their innocent, romantic thoughts of aviation have collided so cruelly with grim reality. Soon they calm down, the teacher lines up a small troop and races it towards the village. Nieman is pleased and beaming with happiness because he was able to catch the whole attack on film. During this whole performance he stood in the gap, filming the falling bombs from the moment they separate from the aeroplanes to the explosions and the fountains of earth they raise into the air. Fresh meteorological reports from the rawlitz bortzen area also predict a gradual improvement in the weather, so we're taking off. The Soviets have already bypassed Gorlitz and are tearing for Bortzen, which is surrounded with the garrison, in the hope of reaching Dresden. ...against these shock wedges, which are trying to cause the collapse of the front held by Field Marshal Schorner's troops, constant counterattacks are launched. With our support, Bortzen is unblocked, and we manage to destroy a large number of vehicles and tanks. These sorties exhaust me. I have lost a lot of blood and apparently my inexhaustible endurance also has its limits. Our successes are shared by ground troops and fighters placed under my command and stationed at our aerodrome. At the beginning of April I am summoned to the Reich Chancellery. The Führer tells me that I must take command of all jet aircraft and with their help to clear the airspace over the new army of General Wenck which is now being formed in the Hamburg area. The first objective of this army will be to strike south towards Graz in order to cut the supply lines of the Allied armies to the east. The success of this operation depends on first clearing the airspace over our own supply lines, otherwise the offensive is doomed to failure. The Führer is convinced of this and General Wenck, appointed to command this operation, agrees with him. I ask the Führer to relieve me of this task, because I believe that at this moment I am indispensable in the sector of Field Marshal Shaw Shawner. His army is involved in the heaviest defensive battle. I ask him to appoint to this post someone closer to him. I point out that my experience is limited to dive bombing and fighting tanks, and that I have always followed one principle never give orders if I could not carry them out myself. With jets I cannot do this, and consequently would feel uncomfortable with group commanders and crews. I must always be able to show the way to my subordinates. You don't have to fly yourself at all, just do the organising. If anyone questions your bravery because you are on the ground, tell me and I will order that person hanged. Yes, a drastic measure, I think but perhaps he only wants to dispel my doubts. We have an abundance of men with experience, but experience alone is not enough. I must entrust this to someone who can organise and carry out this operation in the most vigorous manner. The final decision is never reached that day. I fly back, but a few days later the Reichsmarschall again calls me to him. He gives me the order to fulfil this task. Meanwhile, the situation at the front has deteriorated so much that Germany is threatened with a division into two parts, and carrying out the entire operation would hardly be possible. For this reason and for the other considerations already mentioned, I decline. As the Reichsmarschall makes me realise, this does not surprise him, since, since, since my firm decision not to take command of the Bomber Air Force, he knows exactly my attitude. Nevertheless, the main motive for my refusal 
is that I cannot accept responsibility for something of which I am not convinced of the feasibility. I soon become convinced of the gloomy colours in which the Reichsmarschall sees the situation. As we discuss the situation at the front, leaning over a table with maps spread out, he mutters to himself, I'm wondering when we should set fire to this barn referring to Karen Hall. He advises me to go to the Führer's headquarters and inform him personally of my refusal. Nevertheless, as I have received no orders so far, I fly immediately to my unit, where I am eagerly awaited. But this is not yet my last flight to Berlin. On 19th April, a radiogram comes I am again summoned to the Reich Chancellery. To get to Berlin from Bohemia in a plane without an escort is no longer so easy. In many places, the Russian and American fronts have come very close to each other. There are many aeroplanes in the air, but there are no German aeroplanes among them. I arrive at the Reich Chancellery and I am invited to go to the reception area of the Führer's bunker. There is an atmosphere of calm and confidence here, present mostly army officers who are involved in current or planned combat operations. Outside you can hear the heavy thumping of ton bombs being dropped by mosquitoes in the city centre. The commander-in-chief enters at almost 11pm. I had anticipated the subject of the conversation, this being the assignment discussed earlier. The Führer's hallmark is to go round and round and never speak directly about the matter. And this evening he begins with a half-hour lecture explaining the decisive importance of the development of technology in which we have always led the world, an advantage which we must now utilise to the utmost and thus turn the tide and achieve victory. He tells me that the whole world is afraid of German science and technology, and shows me some intelligence reports which describe the steps taken by the Allies to steal our technical achievements and our scientists. Listening to him, I am amazed every time by his memory for figures and his special knowledge of technical things. At the same time I have flown over 6,000 hours, and with my extensive practical experience I know almost everything about the various types of aeroplanes he talks about, but there is nothing about which he cannot disseminate with inimitable simplicity and about which he has not made pertinent suggestions for modification. During the last three or four months his physical condition has deteriorated. His eyes shine brightly. Oberst von Belov tells me that Hitler has had virtually no sleep in the last eight weeks, one meeting succeeded by another. His hand is shaking, he's had it since the attempt on his life on 20th July. During the long discussion that evening I notice, in addition, that he tends to repeat the same thing, something he has never done before, although his words are clearly thought out and full of determination. When the long preamble is over, the Führer comes to the main subject of which I have so often heard. He enumerates the reasons I was informed of a few days ago and concludes, I wish that this difficult task would have been undertaken by you, the only man who carries Germany's highest honour for bravery. I refuse, giving the same or similar arguments as last time, especially stressing the fact that the situation on the front has become even worse and that it is only a matter of time before the eastern and western fronts meet in the centre of the Reich, and after that the two halves will have to operate separately. Only the northern cauldron can be considered in terms of the fulfilment of this plan, and it is here that all our jets will have to be concentrated. It turns out that the number of airworthy jets and bombers and fighters together, according to the data to date, is 180 machines. At the front, we have long felt that the enemy has a numerical advantage of at least 20 to 1, taking into account that jet aircraft need a particularly long runway, we can begin by considering only a limited number of aerodromes in the northern cauldron. I point out that once we assemble our aircraft at these bases, enemy bombers will bomb them day and night, 
and in purely technical terms their operational effectiveness will be reduced to zero in a matter of days, in which case it will not be possible to control the airspace over Wenk's army and disaster will be inevitable because the army will lose its strategic mobility. I know from personal conversation with General Wenk that his army considers my guarantee of free airspace a reliable factor and takes it into account in all its calculations. This time I accept his responsibility and stubbornly refuse. Once again I am convinced any man whom Hitler considers to be unselfishly serving the interests of the common cause has the right to express his point of view freely and can contribute to the Führer's reconsideration of his position. On the other hand, Hitler loses confidence in those people who have continually disappointed and misled him. He does not agree with my theory of two cauldrons, because he does not believe that it can predict how events will unfold further. He bases his opinion on the firm promise made to him by the sector commanders that they will not retreat from the positions now occupied along the Elbe, the Oder, the Nisi and the Sudeten Mountains. I make the remark that I trust the German soldier now showing particular bravery because he is fighting on German soil. But if the Russians gather all their forces for a concentrated attack at one key point, they will be able to make a gap in our positions and then the two fronts will join. I am reminded of the cases on the Eastern Front in past years, when the Russians threw tank after tank into the battle, and if three armoured divisions could not reach their objectives, they threw ten more. Capturing positions on our depleted Russian front at the cost of huge losses in men and equipment, nothing could stop them. The question, therefore, was whether or not they would exhaust their colossal manpower reserves before Germany was forced to her knees. This did not happen because the aid received from the West was so great. From a purely military point of view, every time we ceded our position in Russia and the Soviets suffered heavy losses, it was a defensive victory. But even though the enemy ridiculed these victories, we knew they were real victories. But this time a victorious retreat would be futile, as the Russians would find themselves only a few kilometres from the Western Front. The Western Allies had laid on themselves the unfortunate responsibility perhaps for centuries to come of weakening Germany only to give additional strength to Russia. At the end of our conversation I say these words to the Führer. From my point of view, at this moment the war cannot be ended by victory on both fronts, but it is still possible to win on one front if we can conclude an armistice on the other. A tired smile slid across his face. It's easy for you to say that. Since 1943 I have endeavoured ceaselessly to make peace, but the Allies have been unwilling to do so from the very beginning of the war they have demanded my unconditional surrender. My personal fate is naturally of no importance, but every man in his right mind can see that I cannot choose unconditional surrender for the German people. Negotiations are going on even now, but I have abandoned all hope of their successful conclusion. Consequently, we must do everything to overcome this crisis so that the weapon can still bring us victory. After exchanging views on the situation of Shauna's army, he tells me that he intends to wait a few days to see whether the general situation develops as he foresaw, or whether my fears will prove justified. In the former case, he will summon me to Berlin to accept the appointment at last. At one o'clock in the morning I leave the Führer's bunker. The first visitors are already waiting in the reception room for their turn to wish him a happy birthday. Early in the morning I returned to Kummer at low altitude to avoid the American Mustangs and Thunderbolts, which soon show themselves in the air and begin circling high above. Being in the air, wondering all the time did they notice me or not, an activity that keeps me more stressed than a combat sortie. No wonder Niemann and I are literally sweating from the exertion. We're glad when we finally land at our base. 
The slight decrease in pressure on our positions west of Gorlitz is due to our daylight operations, during which we were able to inflict heavy losses on the Russians. One evening after my combat sorties I drive to Gorlitz, my hometown, which has been caught up in the battle zone. Here I meet up with many friends from my youth. They are all busy with business, not the least among their duties is participation in the Volkssturm. It's a strange return, we don't express the thoughts that are on everyone's mind. We each have our own load of problems, sorrow and bereavement, but at this moment we see only the threat from the east in front of us. Women are doing the work of men, digging tank traps and putting aside their shovels only to feed hungry children old men have forgotten their age and work until sweat begins to drip from their brow. A grim determination is written on the faces of the girls. They know what the red hordes tearing westwards have in store for them. The men are fighting to survive. If only the nations of the West could see with their own eyes what is happening in these momentous days and realize their significance, they would soon abandon their flippant attitude towards Bolshevism. Only the second squadron stands at Kummer. The regimental headquarters is housed at Nime School. Some of us are living in the homes of the locals, the great majority of whom are Germans. They do their best to fulfill our every wish. Getting to the aerodrome is not always easy. Someone from the passengers of each vehicle is always watching the sky to warn of enemy planes. Russian and American planes roar at low altitude all day long, often engaging each other. When we get in the air, we often find the aim is waiting to ambush us on one side and the Russians on the other. Our old Ju 87s crawl like snails compared to the enemy planes. And when we get close to the target, our nerves are already strained to the limit by the constant air battles. If we attack, the air is buzzing with swarms of enemies. If we go home, we have to again force our way through a ring of enemy planes before we can land. Our anti-aircraft guns covering the airfield have to literally clear the way for us to make our approach. American fighters don't attack us if they see us heading for the front line and engage in aerial combat with the Ivans. We usually take off from Kummer Airfield early in the morning with a force of four or five anti-tank planes. We are accompanied by 12 or 14 FV-190 fighters, carrying bombs and at the same time playing the role of escort. The enemy is waiting for our appearance to attack with a far superior force. Very rarely, if we have fuel reserves, we are able to conduct combined operations with all units under my command, but even then the enemy outnumbers us five to one. It's true. Our daily bread is earned with sweat and tears. On the 25th of April, I receive another radiogram from the Führer's headquarters, sent apparently in complete confusion. Practically nothing can be made out but I guess that I am again summoned to Berlin. I call Luftwaffe headquarters and report that I have been summoned to Berlin and ask permission to fly there. The Commodore refuses to give his consent. According to the army bulletin, the fighting is going on around Tempelhof airfield, and he doesn't know if there is any airfield left not yet captured by the enemy, he said. If you are shot down over Russian-occupied territory, I will have my head chopped off for letting you fly. He says he will try to contact Colonel von Beloff by radio and request his exact message and exactly where I can land, if I can still do so. For several days I hear nothing about the matter, then at 11pm. On 27th April the Commodore calls me and tells me that he has finally succeeded in contacting Berlin and that I am to fly there immediately on a He-111 and land on the broad thoroughfare crossing Berlin, at the place where the Brandenburg Gate stands and the Victory Monument is located. I will be accompanied by Niemann, Taking off in a Heinkel 111 at night does not seem easy, because we have no lights along the perimeter, nor any lighting at all. Besides, the airfield is small in size, and on one side it is approached by quite high hills. 
In order to take off at all, we have to drain the fuel from the tanks to reduce the weight of the aircraft. Naturally, this reduces the time we can be in the air. We take off at one o'clock in the morning, it's pitch black. We fly over the Sudeten Mountains in a northwesterly direction, into the area of ongoing battles. The area below us is lit up with fires, villages and towns are burning, the whole of Germany is in flames. We realize that we cannot prevent this horror, but it is better not to think about it. On the outskirts of Berlin, Soviet searchlights and anti-aircraft guns are already aimed at us. It is almost impossible to orientate ourselves as the city is shrouded in thick smoke. In some places the fire burns so fiercely that it is blinding, and it is impossible to see any landmarks on the ground. I just have to stare into the darkness for a while before I can see anything again, but even then I can't find the city thoroughfare I need. One conflagration after another, guns flashing, a nightmarish sight. My radio operator manages to contact the ground. We are ordered to wait. Fifteen minutes later we receive a message from Colonel Belov that landing is impossible because the road is under heavy artillery fire and the Soviets have already captured Potsdamer Platz. My instructions are to fly to Rechlin and from there call Berlin for further orders. My radio operator has the frequency of this radio station. We are in a hurry to call Rechlin because our tanks are almost empty. Below us stretches an ocean of flames, which can only mean that the Russians have broken into the city, and on the other side, in the neighborhood of Nerupin and only a narrow corridor to the west, is open for escape. As to my request to switch on the lights, Rechlin replies with a refusal, they are afraid that they will immediately incur a night attack by enemy aircraft. I read to them in plain text the instructions for our landing, adding a few not particularly polite remarks from myself. I like all this less and less, because the fuel could run out at any moment. Suddenly, scanty lights come onto our right and mark the outline of some sort of aerodrome. We are landing. But where are we? It's Whitstock, 30 kilometers from Ricklin. Whitstock listened to our conversation with Ricklin and decided to switch on his lights. An hour later at 3 a.m., I arrive at Recklin, whose control room is equipped with radio communication. With its help, I manage to contact Berlin. Colonel von Belov tells me that it is no longer necessary for me to go to Berlin, as Field Marshal Ritter von Grime has been assigned to the place intended for me, with whom it was possible to contact in time moreover. He says that it is no longer possible to land in Berlin. I reply. In the morning I will land on a Stuka on this main line. I think it can still be done on a lighter aeroplane. Besides, it seems important to me to get the Fuhrer out of this dangerous place so that he does not lose control of the whole situation. Von Belov asks me not to hang up while he makes inquiries. He returns to the telephone and says, The Fuhrer has made his final decision. He has decided that Berlin must be held to the last and therefore cannot leave the capital, the situation in which looks critical. He is sure that if he leaves the city, the troops holding it will be convinced that he is abandoning Berlin to its fate and will conclude that any resistance is futile. The Fuhrer therefore intends to remain in the city. You should not attempt to enter the city but you should immediately return to Sudenland to provide support for the army of Field Marshal Schorner, who is ordered to strike in the direction of Berlin. I ask von Belov what he thinks of the situation, because he tells me all this calmly and without emotion. Our situation does not seem too good, but an offensive by General Wenk or Schorner may yet save Berlin. I admire his equanimity. I know what to do and return to my unit to continue combat operations. The shocking news that the head of state and supreme commander of all the armed forces of the Reich is dead has an overwhelming effect on the troops. 
but the Red Hordes are ravaging our country and so we must continue to fight. We will only lay down our arms when ordered to do so by our leaders. It is our duty under our oath. It is our duty in view of the terrible doom that threatens us if we surrender unconditionally, as the enemy insists. It is our duty to the destiny that has placed us geographically in the heart of Europe, and which we have followed for centuries to be the bastion of Europe against the East. Whether Europe realises or not the role which fate has assigned to us, whether it treats us with fatal indifference or with hostility, none of this changes our duty to it one iota. We are convinced that we will be able to hold our heads high when the history of our continent, and especially of the troubled times that lie ahead, is written. The eastern and western fronts are coming closer and closer together. We are finding it more and more difficult to carry out operations. One can only admire the discipline of my men. It has remained exactly the same as on the first day of the war. I'm proud of them. The harshest punishment for my officers, as it has always been, is when they are not allowed to fly with the others on a combat mission. I'm having trouble with my stump. The mechanics designed me an ingenious device similar to the devil's hoof that I fly with. It is attached under my knee and every time I push on it, say, when I need to push the right pedal, the lower part of the residual limb, which has just started to heal, is rubbed so that an ulcer forms on the skin. The wound reopens and starts bleeding heavily. Especially in air combat, when I have to turn sharply to the right, the stump constricts my movements and sometimes after a flight my mechanic has to wipe up the blood, which splatters all over the cabin. I get lucky again in the first days of May. I go to meet Field Marshal Shauna, but I want to look on the way to the Luftwaffe headquarters in Hermannster del Castle, about 75 kilometres away. I fly there in a storch and see that the castle is surrounded by tall trees. In the centre is a park, in the grounds of which I can, I think, land. With me in the aeroplane is the faithful Friedolin. The landing goes safely. After a short stop to pick up some maps, we take off again towards the tall trees, gaining altitude. Storch slowly picks up speed. In order to facilitate the takeoff, I release the flaps just before the forest edge. But the aircraft can't get above the tallest trees. I pull the handle towards me, but we don't have enough speed. It's no use pulling back, the nose of the plane feels heavy. I hear some kind of terrible cracking noise. I've now completely shattered my stump, if nothing worse. Then suddenly everything goes quiet. Am I lying on the ground? No, I'm sitting in the cockpit with Friedolin next to me. We're stuck in a fork of branches at the very top of a huge tree, and we're swaying merrily back and forth. The whole tree is wobbly. The impact must have been too strong. I'm afraid the storch will play another trick on us and flip upside down. Freydolin moves closer and asks anxiously, what's going on? I tell him, don't move or we and what's left of the storch will crash down. The tail and pieces of wings have fallen off and are lying on the ground. I'm still holding the handle. The stump is intact. I didn't hit it against anything. Lucky me. We can't get down from the tree. It's very tall and has smooth bark. We wait and after a while the general appears on the scene. He heard the cracking and now sees us sitting in the tree. He is very pleased that we got off so lightly. As there is no other way to get us down, he sends for the local fire brigade. They help us down a long extension ladder. The Russians have bypassed Dresden and are trying to cross the Erzgeberg from the north to reach the protectorate borders and flank Shauna's army. The main Soviet forces are in the Freiburg area and to the southeast of it. During our last sortie we see south of Dieipoldiswold a long column of refugees being overtaken by Soviet tanks. They roll right through the human stream like asphalt rollers, 
crushing everything in their path. We immediately attack the tanks and destroy them, and the column continues south. Apparently the refugees are hoping to take refuge behind the Sudetan mountains, where they think they will be safe. In the same area, we attack another column of Soviet tanks being protected by tornado-like anti-aircraft fire. I have just shot an his tank and am climbing to 200 meters when, looking around, I notice a hail of debris behind me. They are falling from somewhere above. I ask Nierman which one of ours has just been shot down that seems to me the only explanation and Nierman thinks the same. He hurriedly counts the aeroplanes, but all are there. So no one has been shot down. I look back at the tank and see only a black spot. Could this tank have exploded with such force that its fragments were at such a high altitude? After the sortie, the crews who flew behind me confirmed that it was this tank that exploded and I saw its debris falling downwards. It probably had explosives in it, and its job was to clear the way for other tanks. On 7th May, in order to discuss the plan just drawn up by the High Command, a meeting of Luftwaffe officers is held at the headquarters of Shauna's group. It is proposed that the entire Eastern Front be gradually withdrawn, sector by sector, until it runs parallel to the Western Front. We feel that very sad decisions will soon be made, Will the West, even now, see its opportunity to move against the East, or will it never get to grips with the situation? On 8th May we fly out to search for enemy tanks in the vicinity of Oberleitensdorf. For the first time in the entire war one cannot concentrate on the task. I am choked with an indescribable feeling of bitterness. I have not been able to destroy a single tank. They are still in the mountains where we cannot get them. Absorbed in my thoughts, I turn to go home. We land and go to the control room. Fridolin isn't there. I'm told he's been summoned to group headquarters. Does that mean that? In one jerk I shake off my depression. Nieman call the squadron at Reichensburg and tell them about the new attack. Arrange a place and time to meet the escort I study the situation map. What can be done here? Where has Friedarlin disappeared to? I see a Storch landing off to the side. That's him. Should I run towards him? No, better to wait here. It seems too hot for this time of year. The day before yesterday, two of my men were ambushed and shot by Czechs in civilian clothes. Why is Friedarlin gone so long? I hear the door open and someone enters. I force myself not to turn round. Someone is coughing muffled. Nierman is still on the phone. So it's not Friedolin. There's no way Nierman can get through. That's funny. I'm noticing that today my brain is taking in every detail. All these silly little details that don't matter in the slightest. I turn round and round. The door opens. Friedolin. His face is drained, we exchange glances, and suddenly my throat is dry. Well, it's all I can squeeze out of me. It's over. Unconditional surrender for Darlin's voice sounds no louder than a whisper. The end. I feel as if I'm falling into an abyss, and then in my hazy consciousness they all pass before my eyes the battle buddies I've lost, the millions of soldiers killed at sea in the air, on the battlefield. The millions of victims who died in their homes all over Germany. The hordes from the east that are now flooding our country. Friedolin suddenly explodes give up that damn phone, Nierman. The war is over. We'll decide for ourselves when we stop fighting, Nierman says. Someone laughs rudely. The laughter is too loud, not real. I should do something, say something, ask a question. Nierman informed the squadron at Reichenberg. They have a storch landing in an hour with important orders. Fredolin notices my helpless embarrassment 
and starts talking in an excited voice about the details. The retreat to the West is definitely cut off. Dot, dot, dot. The British and Americans have insisted on unconditional surrender on 8th May, which is today. We have been ordered to hand everything over to the Russians unconditionally by 11 pm. But since Czechoslovakia is to be occupied by the Soviets, it is decided that all German troops should withdraw as quickly as possible to the West, so as not to fall into the hands of the Russians. The flying personnel are to fly home or elsewhere. Fridolin. I interrupt him. Build a regiment. I can't sit and listen to all this any longer. But won't it be worse if you do what you're about to do? What can you tell your men? They've never seen you desperate, but now you're in the very depths of. Fridolin interrupts my thoughts. The regiment is built, I'm out. My prosthesis does not allow me to walk properly. The sun shines in all its spring splendor. Here and there a light haze shimmers silvery in the distance. I stop in front of the formation. My comrades in arms. In arms. I can't go on. Here stands my second group, the first cantonment in Austria. Will I never see them again? And the third in Prague. Where are they now when I want so much to see them around me? All of them. The survivors and the dead. There's a supernatural silence, all eyes on me. I have to say something. After we've lost so many friends, after shedding so much blood at home and at the front, an incomprehensible fate has robbed us of our victory. The courage of our soldiers, of all our people, was unparalleled. The war is lost. I thank you for the loyalty with which you, in this regiment, have served your country. I shake hands with all of them in turn. None of them say a word. The silent handshakes tell me they understand me. As I walk away for the last time, I hear Fridol in command. Fall in. Fall in for the many, many of our comrades who sacrificed their young lives. Fall in for our people, for their heroism, unequalled in history. Equal for the most beautiful legacy the dead have ever bequeathed to posterity. Bow for the countries of the West, whom they endeavored to protect and who are now enclosed in the fatal embrace of Bolshevism. What are we to do now? Is the war over for Immelmelm? Shall we not give the German youth a reason to raise their heads proudly one day and make some final gesture, for example, dive with the whole regiment on an enemy headquarters or other important military target, and with such a death put a worthy end to the list of our combat missions? The whole regiment will be with me as one man, I'm sure of it. I put the question to the group. The answer is no. Perhaps that's right. Enough of the dead already. And maybe we'll have other missions. I decide to lead a convoy heading west. It will be a very long convoy because all the formations under my command, including the anti-aircraft gunners, must follow along with the ground personnel. Everything will be ready by six o'clock and then we will hit the road. The commander of the second squadron receives orders to take to the air and with all the aeroplanes to fly westwards. When the Commodore learns of my intention to lead the column, he orders me, on account of my wound, to fly the aeroplane while Fridolin leads the march. The squadron at Reichenberg remains under my command. I can no longer contact it by phone so I have to fly there with Niemann to brief them on the new situation. The Storch is not gaining altitude well, and I need it because Reichenberg is on the other side of the mountains. I approach the aerodrome with every precaution from the valley side. It looks kind of abandoned. I don't see anyone at first, so I pull up to the hangar with the intention of using the phone in the control room. I am just getting out of the Storch when there is a terrible explosion and the hangar explodes before my eyes. Instinctively we fall down flat and wait for a hail of rocks that blow several holes in the wing. But we are not hit. Near the control room, 
A truckload of rockets catches fire and they fly into the air, sparkling with all the colors of the rainbow. A symbol of disaster. My heart starts to bleed just thinking about it. No one here is expecting my news that it's over. In all likelihood, they got the news from somewhere else. We scramble into our mangled storch and after an interminably long run up the aircraft climbs exhaustedly into the air. We fly back to Kummer, following along the same valley. Everyone is busy assembling, the order of departure is assigned the most favourable, from the point of view of tactics. Anti-aircraft guns are scattered along the length of the column so that they can cover it in case of attack, when the need arises, if someone tries to stop our march. Our objective is American-occupied southern Germany. After the convoy has moved, everyone else, except those who want to wait for me to take off, will fly to wherever. Many of them will have a chance to avoid capture if they can land somewhere near their homes. I can't do that. I intend to land at an American-occupied aerodrome because my leg requires medical intervention, so the idea of hiding somewhere is out. Besides, there are plenty of people who might recognize me. I see no reason why I shouldn't land at a normal aerodrome, in the hope that Allied soldiers will treat even a defeated enemy in a chivalrous manner. The war is over and so I'm unlikely to be arrested and detained for long. I think everyone will be allowed to go home after a short time. I am standing watching the loading of the convoy when I hear a rumble high above us. It's fifty or sixty Russian bombers. Boston's I barely have time to sound the alarm before the bombs start whistling down on us. I am lying on the road, clutching my crutches, and thinking that if these fellows aim well, we shall, with such crowding, have heavy losses. The rumble of explosions is already heard. A carpet of bombs falling right in the centre of the town, a kilometre from the road on which our column is lined up. Poor people of Nimes. The Russians come in again. Even at the second attempt they can't get into the column. Now the cars are moving. I look one last time at my unit, which for seven years has been my world, and all that has mattered to me. How much blood spilled for a common cause has cemented our friendship. I salute them one last time. Northwest of Prague, near Kladno, the column comes across Russian tanks and a very strong military unit. According to the terms of the armistice, all weapons must be surrendered. Unarmed soldiers are guaranteed unhindered passage. Not much time passes after the surrender of weapons when the Czechs attack our defenseless men. Brutally, with disgusting brutality, they mercilessly kill the German soldiers. Only a few are able to make their way west, among them my young intelligence officer, Lieutenant Holf. The rest fall into the hands of the Czechs and Russians. Among those who fall victim to Czech terrorism is my very best friend, Fridolin. It is an immeasurable tragedy that he had to meet such an end already after the war was over. Like their comrades who gave their lives in this war, they too become martyrs of German freedom. The convoy moves off and I return to the Kummer aerodrome. Kachner and Friedolin are still standing next to me. Then they get into the car and drive off to meet their fateful fate. Six other pilots have insisted on flying west with me. We pilot three U-87s and four FV-190s. Among them is the second squadron commander and Lieutenant Schwerblatt, who, like me, lost a leg and has nevertheless done a tremendous job in the last week of destroying enemy tanks. He always says, tanks don't care whether we destroy them with one leg or two. After a hard farewell to Friedolin and Kachner, a gloomy premonition tells me that we shall never see each other again we take off for the last time. It's a strange and indescribable feeling. We say goodbye to our world. We decide to fly to Kitzingen because we know it is a large aerodrome there and therefore, as we imply, is now occupied by the American air fleet. In the neighborhood of Satz we get into air combat with the Russians, who suddenly appear out of the haze and hope, 
intoxicated with victory, to make mincemeat of us. But what they have failed to do in five years, they are failing to do today, during this last battle. We approach the airfield from the east, tensely wondering whether the American anti-aircraft guns will fire on us, even now. A large airfield is already visible ahead. I instruct my pilots by radio telephone that they may crash their aeroplanes on landing. We are not going to hand over still combat-ready machines into American hands. I order the landing gear to disengage and then rip them off while running at high speed. The best thing to do would be to brake sharply with one wheel and pedal with all my might on the same side. I see a crowd of soldiers on the aerodrome. They are lined up as if on parade, probably some sort of victory parade with the American flag flying above them. First, we fly low over the airfield to make sure the anti-aircraft guns won't fire at us when we land. Some of the parade participants look up at us and suddenly see a German swastika above their heads. They immediately rush to the ground. We land in accordance with my orders. Only one of our aircraft makes a soft landing and rolls into a car park. The sergeant from the second squadron piloting this aircraft was carrying a girl in the tail of his plane and was afraid that if he landed on his belly, damage would be done not only to the aircraft, but also to his priceless cargo. Of course, was the first time he had seen her. It just so happened that she was standing lonely on the edge of the aerodrome and didn't want to get to the Russians but his comrades know better. As I was flying first, my aeroplane lying on the road at the very end of the runway, some soldier is already standing by the pilot's cockpit with a revolver pointed at me. I open the cockpit, and he immediately reaches out to grab my knight's cross with gold oak leaves. I push him aside and close the cockpit again. Perhaps this encounter would have ended badly for me if a jeep with a few officers had not pulled up beside me, who gave this mate a headbutt and sent him off to do his business. They came closer and saw that my bandages on my right leg were soaked in blood, the result of the air battle over Sayats. The first thing they did was to take me to the dressing station where they changed my bandages. Nieman doesn't let me out of sight and follows me like a shadow. I am then taken to a large partitioned-off room in an upstairs hall turned into a kind of officer's mess hall. Here I meet the rest of my comrades, who have been brought directly here. They stand at attention and salute me with the salute prescribed by the Fuhrer. At the far end of the room stands a small group of American officers. They do not like this spontaneous salute and mutter something to each other. They obviously belong to the mixed fighter unit that is stationed here with their thunderbolts and mustangs. An interpreter comes up to me and asks if I speak English. He tells me that their commander objects to giving such a salute. Even if I could speak English, I reply, this is Germany here and we only speak German. As for the salute, we were ordered to give it that way, and being soldiers, we follow our orders. Tell your commanding officer that we are pilots of the Immelman Regiment, and as the war is over and no one has defeated us in the air, we do not consider ourselves prisoners. The German soldier, I pointed out to him, has not been defeated in battle on equal terms, but has simply been crushed by staggering masses of fighting equipment. We landed here because we didn't want to stay in the Soviet zone. We'd rather not discuss this any further, but wash up clean up, and get something to eat. Some of the officers continued to scowl, but we doused ourselves so diligently with water that a whole puddle formed on the dining room floor. We are making ourselves at home here. Why don't we wash up? Besides, we're in Germany. We talk without any embarrassment. Then we eat. An interpreter comes and asks us on behalf of the commander of this unit if we could talk to him and his officers when we are done with our meal. This invitation interests us as pilots and we agree, especially when all mention of why and where the war was won and lost is banned. 
From outside comes the sound of gunfire and noise, colored soldiers celebrating victory by getting drunk. I would not like to go downstairs to the ground floor. Bullets fired for the occasion whistle here and there. We go to bed very late. Almost everything except what we had on us is stolen during the night. The most valuable thing I lose is my flight log, which describes the details of every combat sortie, from the first to 2,530. Also missing is my copy of the diamonds, my diamond pilot badge certificate, my Hungarian award, and a lot of other things, not counting watches and other things. Even my custom-made prosthetic was discovered by Nieman under some small guy's bed. Maybe he wanted to carve a souvenir out of it and sell it later as a piece of high jerry. Early in the morning I received word that I was to report to the headquarters of the 9th American Air Force at Erlangen. I refused to do so until my mournful belongings were returned to me. After much persuasion, when I was told that the matter was very urgent, and I could get my belongings back as soon as the thief was caught. I went with Nierman. At headquarters we were first of all questioned by three officers of the general staff. They began by showing us some photographs which they said showed victims of atrocities in the concentration camps. They proved to us that since we had fought for this abomination, we also shared the blame for it. They refused to believe me when I told them that I had never seen a single concentration camp in my life. I added that if any excesses had been committed, they were deplorable and reprehensible, and the real perpetrators should be punished. I pointed out to them that such atrocities had been committed not only by the Germans but by all other nations at all times. I reminded them of the Boer War. Hence, these excesses must be judged by the same criteria. I cannot believe that the piles of bodies shown in the photographs were taken in concentration camps. I told them that we had seen such pictures, not on paper, but in reality after the air attacks on Dresden, Hamburg and other cities, when four-engine bombers indiscriminately literally flooded them with phosphorus and bombs of enormous destructive power, and thousands of women and children fell victim to the carnage. And I assured these gentlemen that if they were particularly interested in atrocities, they would find abundant material from their eastern allies. We were never shown these photographs again. Looking at us with anger, the officer making the interrogation report commented as I finished speaking, Typical Nazi, I don't really understand why you would call someone a typical Nazi just for telling the truth. Do these gentlemen know that we fought for Germany and not for any political party? Believing this, millions of our comrades died. I said to them, the day will come and you will regret that by defeating us you have thereby destroyed the bastion against Bolshevism. This statement of mine seemed to them like propaganda and they refused to believe me. They said we just wanted to divide the Allies and pit them against each other. A few hours later we were taken to the commander of this air army, General Weiland. The general turned out to be of German descent, originally from Bremen. He made a good impression on me, and in the course of our interview I told him of the disappearance of the already mentioned objects, so valuable to me at Kitzingen. I ask him if such incidents are frequent. He makes a fuss, but not over my frankness, but over this disgraceful theft. He orders his adjutant to instruct the commander of the unit stationed at Kitzingen to find my property and threatens the culprits with a court-martial. He asks me to be his guest in Erlangen until everything is returned to me. After the conversation, Nieman and I were driven in a jeep to the suburbs, where an abandoned villa was placed at our disposal. A sentry posted at the gate reminds us that we are not completely free. A car appears to take us to the officer's mess for lunch. The news of our arrival soon spreads among the inhabitants of Erlangen, and the sentry has to negotiate all the time with our many visitors. When he does not fear a sudden visit from his superiors, he tells us, each Nixian. 
This is how we spend five days in Erlangen. Our colleagues who remained in Kitzingen we never had occasion to see again the Americans have no reason to detain them. On the 14th of May Captain Ross, an Air Army intelligence officer, turns up at our villa. He speaks German well and brings us a note from General Wyland, in which he regrets that the search for my belongings has so far come to nothing, but orders have just come that we are to be taken immediately to England for interrogation. After a short stopover in Wiesbaden, we are taken to a special interrogation camp near London. The accommodation and food are ascetic, and the English officers treat us correctly. The elderly captain to whose care we are entrusted is, in civil life, a patent lawyer from London. He visits us every day on inspection, and one day sees my golden oak leaves on the table. He looks at them thoughtfully, shakes his head, and says quietly, almost fearfully, how many human lives it has cost. When I explain to him that I earned this order in Russia, he leaves us with marked relief. During the day I am frequently visited by British and American intelligence officers in varying degrees of curiosity. I soon realize that we hold opposing views. This is not surprising when you consider that I have made almost all combat sorties in an aircraft of low speed and my experience is therefore quite different from that of the Allies who tend to exaggerate the value of every extra kilometre per hour, even if only as a mere guarantee of safety. There is no way they can believe that I have made over 2,500 combat sorties in such a slow aircraft. They are also not at all interested in learning from my experience, since there are no safety guarantees here. They brag about their missiles, which I already know about, and which can be fired from the fastest aircraft, they don't like it when I tell them that the accuracy of these missiles is much less compared to my guns. I don't particularly mind these interrogations. My successes have not been achieved with any technical secrets. Thus our conversations are little more than a discussion about aviation and the war that has just ended. The British make no secret of their respect for the achievements of the enemy their attitude is built on notions of sporting integrity, and we welcome it. For 45 minutes every day we can walk behind barbed wire. The rest of the time we read and make plans for what we will do after the war. After about a fortnight we are sent north and interned in a regular American prisoner of war camp. There are many thousands of prisoners in this camp. Only the bare minimum of food is given, and some of our comrades who have been here for some time have become weak from exhaustion. My stump is giving me trouble and I need a new operation. The camp medical chief refuses to perform the operation on the grounds that I have been flying with one leg, and he is not at all interested in what is happening to my stump. It is swollen, inflamed, I suffer from acute pain. The camp authorities could not think of better propaganda among the thousands of German soldiers in favour of their former officers. Many of our guards know German well. They emigrated to the States after 1933 and speak German as well as we do. The black soldiers have a good disposition and are alert, except when they are drunk. Three weeks later I along with Neerman and most of the badly wounded are transferred to Southampton. We crowd aboard the cargo ship Kaiser. When 24 hours pass and no food is brought to us, we suspect this will continue all the way to Cherbourg, because the American crew is going to sell our rations on the French black market. A group of Russian front veterans, having learnt of this, break into the pantry and take the distribution of food into their own hands. The sailors on this ship, who learn of this raid much later, have their faces pulled. The journey from Cherbourg to our new camp near Carrington is not a pleasant one, as the French civilians greet even seriously wounded soldiers with a hail of stones. We are not helped by memories of what a truly comfortable life the French civilians often led while in Germany. 
Many of them were sensible enough to welcome their lives of comfort a time when we were holding back the Soviets in the East. And those who throw stones at us today will wake up one day. Conditions in the new camp are almost the same as in England. And here I am at first refused an operation. There's no telling when I'll be released from here, held back at least because of my rank. One day I am taken to Cherbourg Aerodrome, and at first it seems to me that I am being handed over to the Ivans. It will be something for the Soviets to get Field Marshal Schorler and me as a prize for a war won on the ground and in the air. The compass shows 300 degrees, so they're taking us to England again. Why? We land about 30 kilometres out to sea at Tangmere Airfield, home to the Royal Air Force Command School. Here I learn that my transfer has been secured by Major Bader. Bader is the most popular pilot in the RAF. He was shot down during the war and flew on prosthetics. He learned that I had been interned at Carrington Camp. He himself had been a POW in Germany and had made several attempts to escape. He can tell stories that differ from the fabrications of the vicious agitators, who by all means try to brand us Germans as barbarians. This time spent in England has been a real rest cure after the prisoner of war camps. Here I rediscover that there is a respect for the achievements of the enemy, a chivalry which is natural to every officer in the service of any country in the world. Bader sends me to London to the man who made his prosthetics in the hope that he will make me the same. I decline this generous offer because I can't pay for the order. I've lost everything in the East and I don't know yet what may happen in the future. In any case, I won't be able to repay him in pounds sterling. Major Bader is almost insulted when I refuse to take advantage of his kindness and worry about payment. He brings the man with him and the latter makes a plaster cast. The prosthetist returns a few days later and tells me that the stump must be bloated from the inside as it is thicker at the end than at the base. And before he can finish making the prosthesis, an operation must be performed. A few days later an inquiry comes from the Americans regarding me, because it turns out that I have only been borrowed for a while and must be returned to my place. My holiday is almost over. During one of my last days in Tangmir, I had a much clarifying discussion with RAF cadets who were in flight school. One of them, a non-Englishman, hoping no doubt to enrage or humiliate me, asks what I think the Russians might do to me if I return to my native places in Silesia. I suppose the Russians are clever enough, I reply, to take advantage of my experience. In the field of tank fighting, which is inevitable in any new war, my explanations may put the enemy Russians at a disadvantage. I have destroyed more than 500 tanks, and supposing that during the next few years I should train five or 600 pilots, each of whom would destroy at least 100 tanks, you can yourself guess how many tanks the enemy's industry would have to produce to make up for all these losses. This answer generates widespread surprise and I am excitedly asked how this can be reconciled with my past attitude towards Bolshevism. So far I have not been allowed to say anything disparaging about Russia, their ally. But now I am told about the mass deportations to the East and told about the cases of rape and atrocities, about the bloody terrorism with which the hordes that swooped down from the Asian steppes tortured the subjugated peoples. This is something new to me, because previously they had carefully avoided touching on the subject, but now their views are exactly in line with our own, quite often expressed opinions, and expressed in words that are often copied from our vocabulary. The RAF commanders who piloted hurricanes on the side of the Russians at Murmansk share their recollections, and they are extremely sharp. Of all of ours shot down, almost no one was left alive and you want to work for the Russians, they exclaim. I was very interested to hear your opinion of your allies, I reply. 
Of course, I have not said a word about what I think of it myself. I have only answered the question you asked me. No further mention is made of Russia in my presence. I am taken back to the French camp, where I continue for some time longer. The efforts of the German doctors are finally crowned with success, and I am transferred to a hospital. A few days before, Neumann is released in the British zone. He begs several times to be left with me, but it cannot be delayed any longer. A week after I leave the French camp, I find myself on an ambulance train to the hospital in Starnbergersee. At Augsburg, our train is turned round and sent to Firth. Here, after a stay in a military hospital, in April 1946, I managed to secure my release.